All right, everybody, I think we're going to get started. We have, I'm one minute early, but people can trickle in as they need to kind of thing. Um, perfect, we'll get the lights. So a little bit about me. I am a graphic designer from Ottawa, Ontario. I am also a stand-up comedian, um, and it's a passion project. I'm not a professional, so I do indie shows mostly. Um, currently, I work for the Canadian Physiotherapy Association as their in-house designer. And prior to that, I worked for Canadian Internet Registration Authority, where I was their in-house in designer as well. Um, and that was prior to my role at Ideal Protein, where I mass migrated 1,300 websites from HTML to WordPress, which I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, I also co-organize and speak on panel discussions at WordCamp Ottawa. Um, and this is my first solo presentation, actually. Woohoo! Thank <laughs> you. Scary. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, so I'll get started on what is Ideal Protein. So it's a weight loss uh, management tool. Um, so they currently have 35 clinics across the globe, and 1,300 of those clinics bought the approved websites um, that I worked on. Um, so they mainly sell meal replacements, um, drinks, condiments, and snacks, along with one-on-one -on -one coaching, and they have an app to um, set goals and monitor weight loss progress. Perfect. Um, so here's a sample of the old websites on the left-hand side and the new WordPress templates on the right-hand side. Um, so when I first started, all 1,300 websites were on a legacy content management system built in about 2012, um, and it caused many issues, um, glitches, and was difficult to mass update. Um, the websites, as you can see, are very basic six to eight pages for simplicity's sake, as we were just a team of two people um, working on the websites and maintaining their updates. Um, and we were actually a part of the IT team at that time. A custom plugin was also built um, to feed leads from each website's contact form into a leads panel through the app that was available to each clinic owner. So I'll start with the initial setup. Um, you could see on the right-hand side there was a registration form, so clinics could submit their website addresses, um, and a custom header image, um, list their web domain, emails, um, and these re form results li linked into our Zendesk ticketing system that then emailed us the requests. Um, and we started off with the six templates that you can see on the left-hand side. And I'll talk about some lessons learned from this a little bit later as well. Um, there was also a terms of agreement sec section that they had to agree to at the bottom of the registration form, which limited the number of updates and the number of pages that they could make per month um, because we were a team of only two people. <laughs> Um, there was another form for migrated websites that needed modifications made to their site. This form was organized by page type, and we most often received requests to add new customer testimonials to each website. There was also another basic form, um, which was a lot more simple, and this seemed to be a lot easier for clients, so they would o most often make their submissions through this very basic form. Um, so now I'll talk about the initial setup through WP Engine. So we actually set up multi-site. Um, so all sites within the multi-site network shared the same core files, theme, and plugins. Updates within the multi-site only had to happen once rather than logging into each individual website. Um, we had four pods set up within the WP Engine instance and found that the back end of each pod slowed down when we reached of 350 websites per pod. Now we'll move over to the website build process. We used a number of plugins, but I'm just going to cover the top plugins that I used. Um, so first off, multi-site clone duplicator. Um, that cloned the initial template, including all of the page content, short codes, settings, users, and roles. 
I also used short coder because most, co most of the websites had the same content, but we used the short coder to adjust elements for things that appeared multiple times in the content. This included the email address, phone number, and clinic names in each instance. We also used domain mapping by WPMU Dev. Um, so that helped me map the website address for each domain um, as it was finalized. The advantage to this plugin was that it supported HTTP and HTTPS, which from my research, not all plugins could do. So after all that, we were all set to start the migration. I was eager to get a master list of all of the websites that I needed to work out, um, only to find out that there actually wasn't a master list. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So that was, this is good. I'm really excited to go through uh, my challenges with you. Um, so challenges, oh my. First off, as I mentioned, no master list kept up to date anywhere. Um, the marketing team had never even seen a clinic website. Um, so again, I'll talk more on lessons learned, but in the, within the company, the marketing team was on the second level and the IT team was on the bottom level of the building. So logistically, we were far away from each other and didn't really speak to each other very often. So a huge communication issue, which I worked through as well. Um, and third off, uh, third of all, there was no successful strategy in place to communicate with clinic owners to even choose their new template. <coughs> so first off, we'll start on the issue of no master list and how, how did I even realize this? Well, nobody could pull me a list from anywhere, so I pulled myself a list from HiRISE and I started manually spot checking the notes and correspondence with the clinic owners. I found out um, that there had been requests for the odd website to be canceled and those websites were indeed still live, um, <laughs> which meant that we, ha we were still paying for hosting for all of these websites. I asked more questions and found out that a separate list of even more websites needed to be exported because HiRISE did not include web domains that we didn't own. So I got that list as well, I merged everything, and essentially prepped it for import to our CRM tool. Um, and our CRM tool was at that time just being built um, by requirements that were provided by the sales team. So the web de development team was not consulted at all. Another communication issue, I would say. Um, so I did manually check each domain and its status in HiRISE and within the finance invoicing tool before importing. So the next part of my audit um, was to meet with the sales and dev teams. I found out that over the last year, the website team had never been informed of a single website suspension due to staff turnover. So the websites were supposed to be suspended when a clinic hadn't paid their invoicing for three months, but there was no communication process happening within the company for that. Um, so I then met with the CRM developers and I provided them with proper requirements that included fields for website suspensions and cancellations with date pickers. Automated alerts and reporting were set up to, to notify us of the website statuses every week. The client services team was also trained on how to use these new fields. Now over to the finance team, of course. So I asked even more questions and then I got a login to our finance invoicing tool. I had to let the finance team know that there were over a hundred outstanding or unpaid invoices um, that affected the websites. I explained that I didn't know if I should be migrating these websites since they were unpaid. Um, the finance team got the invoices resolved within a month through phone calls and a new process was put in place so that they would notify us weekly of clinics that had not paid their invoices in three months. And then they started to make calls to follow up. So next up was the marketing team. I couldn't believe that the marketing team had never even seen a, an approved website. It was crazy to me. Um, <laughs> So I sat down with them and I walked them through the website's templates and capabilities. 
they had just launched the marketing guidelines um, and mailed them to each clinic, excluding the approved websites. Um, this would have been a good opportunity to advertise the new templates that we were just developing. Um, but again, they didn't know what the IT team had been building. So next up was the strategy. After I got all the business process audits and processing in place, um, I was ready to start my own strategy because there wasn't one in place to communicate with these clinic owners. So I e-blasted 200 clinics per day, um, advertising the new website features, and I included the migration request form. Migrations finally started happening, and I was able with my setup to do eight migrations per day. So very important to talk about the lessons learned here, um, <laughs> not to rip on my teammates, but the sales team was not interested in doing anything that didn't make them commission. Um, so they weren't even interested in bringing up these websites on the phone because they had already sold a website, they already made their commission, and the, obviously the migrations wasn't going to make them money. There was also a business account manager team, and they were also not interested in bringing up the websites on their calls because they were commission-based as well. Mm -hmm. um, I also learned that having six template options was too many, mm -hmm. so clinic owners were actually overwhelmed with that selection. Um, they often did ask our sales rep to just go ahead and choose a template for them, so they didn't have any interest in reviewing the live demos we had set up. So that was strange to me. Um, Let's see, what else did I have here? So not all clinic owners were responsive to the e-blast from MailChimp, even after sending it to them three times. Um, and even direct calls, when I did get people to make these direct calls, um, people weren't, like generally the clinic owners weren't that responsive by phone because they meet face-to-face -face all day with their clients and they're always coaching them through their weight loss program. So that was interesting set of challenges that I didn't really expect. Now over to the Gutenberg impact. Um, so I've been asked to discuss how I would have evaluated this project um, had it been, had Gutenberg been released prior to the project. Um, so if Gutenberg had been released prior to this project, I still would have used Divi as the uh, theme and page builder. And I'll go through Divi here. So what is Divi? For those of you who haven't heard of it, it's a drag and drop builder that includes 46 modules to build pages and posts. The Divi builder is added to the page editor. Most importantly, it supports global elements. For example, we re required the exact same text to be included on different websites, and Divi allowed, allowed us to update and deploy the common text as needed, which Gutenberg does not yet to my knowledge. So what about Gutenberg? I'm sure in your sessions today you've heard a lot about it. It's a new editor for WordPress, as you know, that lets you build content with blocks. It enhances page customization and editing for a basic user. And in this instance of the 1300 websites, I set up templates that require minimal content customization for the ease of maintenance of over 1300 sites because we were just a team of two people. Each end user could only actually view basic Google Analytics when they logged in, um, so the simplicity of the Gutenberg editor would not actually have benefited them. So I found this great article on divicake.com. I've included the URL there. Um, it kind of just li lists out the Divi versus Gutenberg pros and cons. Again, Divi has had a much longer development period, whereas Gutenberg is just starting. I'll leave that up. Um, I've also listed here some of the cons of Divi versus Gutenberg. The Divi yes, <laughs> divicake.com. I do like that, that name, actually. It's quite fun. Um, so again, Divi isn't free, and it does require a premium subscription, which includes access to every theme and plugin through Elegant Themes, which worked well for our instance because we needed access to those plugins anyway. So in conclusion, I really think it depends on your instance and your clients. 
Um, Gutenberg may suit your needs as it evolves. Only time will tell. I always recommend gathering requirements and doing research and testing before starting any mass project like this. Um, I'd like to thank our organizers again for putting this together today for us, as well as our sponsors. Um, and then I'd like to ask you guys if you have any questions. Christian, what was your actual process of doing the migration? So we would log in, so we had those three separate pods, and uh, <laughs> it's very complicated to explain via via slides or verbally, um, but we actually use that clone duplicator plugin that I covered, and we would actually just clone one of our templates and customize with those short code plugins. So those three base plugins that I listed out, which I can go back to if you'd like, those were key in um, basically doing that. So they had common um, content. Oh, so did you migrate a lot of the existing content? No, so we actually had approved content, um, and most of it was a listing of our products and things like that, so it was canned content. So basically, we just cloned all of that existing content. Yep. When you were having people fill out forms, what kind of success rate did you have with that? Um, so we didn't have a lot of success um, because, again, those clinic owners are meeting face-to-face -face with their customers all day, so it was hard to even get well, them to... I think to everybody hates filling out forms, yeah. and that's why I, I yeah. I thought to myself, it's a great way to create workflow, mm -hmm. but I don't think people are terribly responsive to forms. It's true. They were more responsive to our sales rep again calling and mentioning it, and then they would even just ask our sales rep to fill out the form on their behalf. So that was interesting, actually. It was worth a try. I would say like maybe 25% of people filled out forms so themselves. So you had a quarter of the people actually fill out the forms without it being prompted by a sales call or other call. Okay. Correct, yeah. So that's, that's actually really 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 good yeah exactly and that's taking into consideration that people didn't necessarily read or click the email mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I would think a 10 percent success rate would be pretty typical when you're sending them a form. yeah for sure that's interesting did, did the owner of the company encourage people to say listen this is part of your job and if you want to be part of this ship you have to do this yes yeah, so from the top, the CEO actually ran another business and he was never present in the office. So that's a huge um, roadblock and lesson learned that I don't want to address too much. Yes, exactly. I had never actually met him during my time there or seen him even walk by my desk. So that was part of the issue. <laughs> the humans. Yes, exactly. It's so true. <laughs> yes. So is this a franchise operation? Is that the it's a, yeah. Yeah, they're small business owners that purchase our product and resell it, essentially. Uh, yes? I, I, maybe I missed it at the beginning, but these 1,500 websites were essentially all the same template or the same bones, at least, uh, one to the other. Correct, yeah. So that's mainly how I cloned them all one by one. So, yeah, they're essentially the same content. And were they also the, the only web presence uh, of these clinics, or did they, they had other yeah, I mean, they had social media presence as well, but it was the only website presence. Yes, in the back. You mentioned you were able to move about eight a day. Mm -hmm. What was the bottleneck in your process that made it, that constrained you to that amount? Or um, so that, there was no bottlenecks. That was actually full capacity. So it did take me one hour to complete one website. So it was about an eight hour work day and one site per hour type of thing. Yeah, I mean, they are only six pages, and again, they were canned content, so it was just through the short coder that we customized those few fields type of thing. So what was, like, what was the longest part of the one-hour migration? Was it downloading and uploading the content into a separate server, or I'm just curious? It was often the domain mapping, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, so especially the secured HTTPS, so, and waiting for all of that to, to work. Yeah. Christine. Um, could you elaborate a bit more on the pods? Mm -hmm. Why is that necessary and uh, how did you do it? Um, so that is through WP Engine. Um, so we had the three separate pods and I believe that is server instances through WP Engine. Um, and again, I'm not really like a server expert type of thing. Um, so I would consult them and I'm sure if we did have a 
more resources, we could have optimized the load time and the server runtime to kind of have more than the 350 so websites. Did the three parts get belong to the same multi-site? Uh, they were separate multi-site instances. Yeah, so 350. So you, have update, you have to actually update three sites. Three pods, yes, correct. A lot of the words you're using, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> um, but I have a question. So, like, I work on a marketing team. Okay. And, like, maybe beyond, like, hypothetically having seen your website before you start the migration, what are two other things you would have wanted the marketing team to know before you sort of started this project? Um, so, I would have wanted them to know that we're working on it, but I would have wanted them to know, I guess, a lot of the new benefits of those new websites um, and the ease of updates the modernized content, and I guess the Google Analytics availability for those clinic owners would have been the top three um, features mm -hmm. that we would have wanted. And in turn, then, what could have that marketing team have given you to have helped your process? Um, so I guess they could have just aided us in distributing the knowledge um, through those marketing guidelines that they had set, sent out. They could have listed the pros and basically put a call to action in those marketing guidelines, like choose your template today with that URL for the migration request form. Um, yeah, so that would have been very helpful. Anything else from anybody? How long did it take you from beginning to end for migrating later? How many? So it was a one year project. Yes, I did move on after that. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, no, not quite. But my colleague is still there maintaining the websites, actually. So it is a full-time job still. Even though we set it up within WordPress, there's just always changes. Um, clinics are changing their addresses, their names, their phone numbers, etc. So that is still a full-time role for him, even with our, our rock-solid instance that we set up. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Than what you got hired to do, and you went off into other departments. You pulled yes. the finance department, they weren't doing I, their job. Yeah, I taught them how to pull their own reporting from their own finance tool. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's just, yeah. I think it's a great lesson for everybody because you can get hired as a content creator, web designer, or developer and get told to run out a project, but it's really good to take a step back actually and look at the whole process beforehand because I had like built all of these templates and been told to run at something that I said we're not even in a place to start this. So yeah, so I think that's a key takeaway from this whole talk, <laughs> which was very interesting actually, for sure. But I find outsiders, you, you know, you have the, when you come from outside, you see all the deficiencies in the short time, it just makes no sense. Mm -hmm. The people who are in there, they're too close. Yes. Think, it's all frequent. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. for sure. Yes, sir? That was a server issue through WP Engine. Um, and I mean, it only ran slow on the back end when we were logged into each website when it did reach 350 websites. Um, so from a front end standpoint, it was still running quickly. Um, yeah, and that's something if we had more resources like a web developer, then they could optimize the code. Um, if we had a server specialist, they could have also looked at that for us. But again, only a team of two people working on it. So, and we had to get them done within a certain time period. So we kept running at it. So on, on the multi-site side, there are 1,300 instances of the one name. Um, no, not exactly. Um, so it's 350 <coughs> websites on the back end of each pod type of thing. So I'm not sure. Multi-site would be one name. Oh, so there is three multi-sites okay. with yes. So there was three different yes, multi correct, okay. for sure. Did you consider moving to the cloud at all? Um, we were advised to do that by WP Engine. My coworker at the time didn't want to go that route. I'm not sure why. But. Yes. 
we had some trouble getting some buy-in from salespeople and the uh, business analysts because of uh, commission involved. Uh, yeah. There's no incentive for them to do it. How did you end up getting them to eventually make those calls? Um, so I escalated it to my manager and you know, my manager would talk to them about it and then I would also, I guess, check the notes in high rise and see that they weren't mentioning it on their calls and actually I had to brought them out basically because I couldn't do my job unless they did. So yeah, it's interesting. You think you're with a team and then you can realize you're very quickly not and people are just there to make money, which is a good point on running a business that is commission based. You actually will, I don't know, things will fall apart and grow old and the web presence is very important. So yeah, sorry, go you ahead. You mentioned you started out as a graphic designer yet you seem to have migrated to being a, a business, uh, <laughs> almost uh, really managing a business. Yes. In respect to meet your requirements. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about that journey? From because, and you're going from graphic designers generally like to create <laughs> unique things, or at least that's mm -hmm. one of the things. And when you're working in the production environment of 1,300 websites that are uh, ostensibly very similar, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about that journey for yourself? Yes, for sure. So I did find that as a graphic designer pre in my previous role, it was getting um, I was getting caught up in numbers of revisions on the same project. Um, so then I wanted a change. Um, and the change was to go and try more of a web-based design. But I did find that that was a bit too repetitive. Um, but when I look back on it, I did learn a lot from the business process standpoint. And I did network and meet a lot of people who will then provide me with a lot of opportunities going forward, knowing the audit and how thorough it was, which I did for that company. So I think it's open doors for me from the business analysis standpoint. But I think at the end of the day, graphic design is still my passion. Um, but it was still a good lesson learned to never like run at any web design or development pro project without taking a step back and asking more questions. So it's a very interchangeable skill for sure. Yes? Why six different designs? Was there not something that should have been consistent in terms of marketing and brand appearance across? So that's a good question. Each clinic actually did have their own logo and branding. Um, so yeah, so they did want a slightly different look for sure. Um, but again, they, they did find that six was too many options. It seemed like they didn't want to think about it at all. So, which was strange to me. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure what the best. So what kind of different, what would have differentiated the six different designs in your mind, maybe not theirs, but why did you give them six? Um, well, I guess originally, it seemed like in 2002 or 2006, when they first built the original website templates, they had given them hundreds of options. Like they advertised it as like, choose from 150 different templates. So I guess we were trying to tighten that up with the six different options. And then I guess the web in general has evolved and changed where you know marketing that as 150 options is no longer a good idea. And probably we grew as a company and the clinics are so far apart globally that it doesn't really matter as much that they look, have a different look and feel. So, yeah. Yeah, so often I would crop logos um, and we did have our templates set up so that we could choose an accent color which would populate the hovers, um, it would populate the hyperlinks. So basically we would just, we had it set up so that we could pull their one accent color um, and put it throughout the, the website pretty quickly. Did you have requirements for their logos? Like uh, limit and font and what was the... Uh, yeah, we did, um, we did put a certain width and height it didn't matter as much because I would crop it um, yeah and then otherwise sometimes they have no graphic skills so I would have to inverse their logo if I needed to type of thing and you and that was that was part was part of the one hour you would take per, per website yeah I, I'm pretty quick like with an eyedropper yeah. tool you're just like boom 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 done but uh, not all not every day was eight per day I would say six to eight is the most accurate depending on the, the instance so yeah, for sure. Yep. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the uh, multi-site uh, clone tool and how good it is at uh, switching HTML to, um, to Gutenberg or Divi? Um, right? Yeah, I was using Divi. Um, so I'm trying to 
So you're asking how, it, basically it worked flawlessly. Um, I never had any glitches using Divi within it. So again, literally I just cloned it, um, worked with r r right within the Divi instance. Um, and again, we had global elements. Um, so we would change it once in the master template and then deploy that to all 350 templates. And we never ran into any issue. We just had to keep that page open and we could see the progress on each website and it would kind of show a check mark as we did it. So, so yeah, no glitches from what I experienced. So was the code clean? Uh, was it validated? How was the speed? Um, the speed on the back end was, was slow again, as I mentioned, but on the front end, it was pretty optimal. Uh, yep. Quick question. Uh, you mentioned the template and uh, some of the other things. What did you consider to be the absolutely crucial thing you have to have in order to make the conversion go smoothly from the programming or coding point of view? Um, I think just having initial stable templates set up and a lot of testing done of the clone duplicators and the plugins um, and testing for, I guess, any conflicts. I, so yeah, again, testing at the end of the day is the most critical component to all of that. Yeah, um, I did list the three plugins that were most important to me. Um, so the clone duplicator, the short coder, as I mentioned. Um, I can't think of anything offhand that was absolutely critical other than those top three. I felt they were most important, so that's why I kind of flagged them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Y yes. Uh, when you were flying in each side, like were you getting the plugins flying through? Sorry, I missed the. That last when, you, part. when you were cloning the sites, were you cloning or w were part of the cloning getting the plugins into it? No, so the clone duplicator plugged all of, uh, cloned all of the plugins and settings and users and roles. So yeah, so it was great. So my colleague and I were automatically admins on, on this, every site that we cloned. So um, have been uh, an issue of cloning that was slowing down the site? Yeah. Uh, no, we didn't experience that. Um, yeah, not, not at all, actually. And so it was really neat because we could actually just update the plugins at the top level. Um, we never had to do it on each individual site. Yep. Um, you may not want to answer this question, that's okay. Ideal Protein is a company I've never heard of. Some place with 1,300 uh, like presences and, mm -hmm. and so on. And I'm wondering how this migration impacted their exposure or their how they were perceived as a company. I, I don't know how many other people have heard of Ideal Protein. I, I, I haven't. Yeah. And I'm just wondering also, like, does it help to do this kind of a migration for somebody who's got 1,300 sites? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, so the marketing team did have an SEO specialist who was uh, measuring the success. And I guess they could buy additional packages um, for a certain price to add on like Google ads and services like that. So he would have been the person within the company kind of tracking that. But because I just migrated them and then moved on, I actually haven't talked to them to know what the results were. But that is a very good question, actually. Um, and again, because our CMS was custom built before, I don't imagine it had very good SEO at all for those clinics because it was built way back when, right? And SEO evolves, as we know, like every day. So yeah, so I imagine it still did benefit them, but he would have been the one measuring the success. Yes? There was a contact form that was interactive, and there was a, a custom plugin was built to feed those leads right into our app for the clinic owners to then get those leads. So wasn't necessarily. I, I have a similar related question because you mentioned that it was on the CMS before. Mm -hmm. uh, is it that the CMS was such a mess, you wanted to go to a static inference of it to just get your content reliably instead of messing around with the back end? Yes, okay. exactly. And to modernize the look of the websites. Um, there was a number of reasons. Um, trying to think of what else. Just yeah, everything you could think of, really. I mean, I, like if we needed to mass update a word or content or anything, we couldn't do that on our old system. Um, I don't even think it was supporting special characters. So 
yeah, it was pretty crazy, that instance. Uh, yep. Yeah, I have um, a left-handed question. In, in, in your in, in introduction, you spoke of being a comedian. Yes. Which is unusual, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, so that's an interesting question. I would say I am such an introverted designer, and as most developers and web people are, it is just totally a random thing that I do stand-up comedy. It does not tie in at all. And comedy is a certain persona that I try to keep separate from my work life, and I've invited my coworkers to come and see my comedy and gotten quite some uh, interesting faces and reactions during that. <laughs> so I, yeah, so keeping, I guess, Com comedic life and professional life separate is probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah, for sure, because it's yeah, it's interesting how it's received, I guess, by coworkers. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Yes, yeah, we have so since, many. Since it was brought up specifically, I went to the Ideal Protein website, and I don't see any listing of the locations. So oh. is that is there no connection between the multi-site and no, so the main site was managed by the marketing team. There is a clinic locator, at least there was when I was looking, when I was working there. Um, the menu. Yeah, it okay, might. This is at the bottom of the okay. Location. Yeah, and then you can type in your postal code and see all of those locations regionally populate. Did you work on the app? Was it a web app or was it a... The app was an iPad and iPhone app far as I know and I didn't work on that actually I just made I just worked briefly with the developers to test um, my templates to make sure those leads would populate with them type of thing and obviously added the plugin to the, the sites but yeah I didn't build that at all so that was a WordPress app using AMP uh, a plugin to speed it up it was a WordPress plugin that was custom built I would just say p page load time, so that's probably a Divi. It's, it was within the Divi editor that we would see slow response time, and, and for the when we clicked edit for something to open up, it would just take a long time. But that didn't appear on the runtime side? No, pages, like you could click them and, and load them, no problem. And I mean, WP Engine has caching and all sorts of things okay. like that that made it load quickly on the front end. Yeah, so we were starting to build uh, French language templates. So I don't, my colleague was in charge of the French language as I was doing, tackling the English ones. So, so I'm not that familiar with his approach. No, not, not at that time. Okay. So the bilingual sites, uh, sorry, the user experience would be that it's a bilingual site, but it would actually be, if it's thinking in English and in French, it would be two separate sites and just be shuffling in different URLs. Correct, yes. All right, any more questions? That was great, lots of questions, which is always good. It's probably longer than my actual presentation. <laughs> <laughs>